Greetings. This video was at least in part inspired by a series of PMs I received from a subscriber of mine hailing from the distant land of dangerous fauna, otherwise known as Australia. Watch out for those Sydney funnel webs. But I have had this idea for a while, the idea being testing a hypothesis. Well, essentially what I have tried to do on this channel, and certainly what Barbarossa has done as well, is offer up hypotheses uh, as to how women function and behave in relation to men, in order to arm men with knowledge, uh, in, in order to basically equip men with the tools of dealing with women if required, and uh, of simply bettering themselves, bettering their own situations, uh, to to eliminate the clouds of ignorance, if you will. But the question arises, of course, uh, can you test these hypotheses? Now, I'm not going to recount the entire tale, but essentially this Australian subscriber of mine uh, told me a very interesting story um, prior to discovery of my channel of how he had journeyed to Thailand and noticed all of a sudden how nicely and how kindly the women there uh, treated him. Uh, and, of course, the question being, why did they do this? They were all of a sudden were trying to curry favor with him, uh, to ingratiate themselves with him, and so on and so forth. And uh, how this was standing in such marked contrast to the behavior he had been accustomed to the in the land of Oz. And he journeyed back to the land of Oz and discovered, well, women are not behaving this way. And then he discovered my channel and uh, the rest is sort of history. The point being that his observation was of how women uh, respond, so powerfully respond to economic incentives, that they will literally reverse their behavior. I mean, a, a frown, a 100% frown plastered on their faces will turn into a 100% smile if the economic incentives are there. What I'm trying to say here is that you can actually test the hypotheses that have been proposed. You, if, if, for example, if people doubt the validity of various theories of hypergamy and how it works, that's very easily testable. And go to Thailand, where feminism is not the primary uh, soup du jour, if you want to call it that, and see how they act. See why they're acting and then go back to whatever your own country might be and see how they're acting there. You can actually test these hypotheses. You can see whether or not hypergamy theory is actually correct, whether women will modify their behavior in many cases in an extreme manner in order to garner uh, and curry favor with men who uh, are of good economic standing or financially stable or can offer them money. So the premise of this video is that these, all these hypotheses can actually be tested. Uh, it's often said that women uh, don't like men for their personhood, for who they, who they are, but for what they can do for them, what, they, what men can give them. I'm going to expand on that and uh, actually say the following. I don't even think women like men a whole lot, not in general. But sure, most heterosexual women sense a, or have a vague sense of sexual attraction towards men, and you know, they're, they're attracted to them, they're heterosexual women on some level. But the fact that in, in, modern, in the modern era, the state, the faceless man, uh, provides women with virtually everything they need, and you can see the level of dysfunction in relationships, is a testament to the fact that women don't even like men very much. I mean, they, they what they need is something, some source of economic and uh, social stability, something that's going to allow them to uh, live in a stable environment. If the faceless man, i.e. the state, can give that to, to women, in general, they will take that. And this is my own hypothesis. 
I envision or I imagine a world where, let's just say, it's a bit fantastical, but a, a giant supercomputer were to take over the functions of the state and the supercomputer, for whatever reason, could somehow benefit from interaction with women, just as the state, the faceless man, benefits from you know votes and what have you, then that supercomputer would be just as valid a quote-unquote partner to women as the state, the faceless man is, or as the the men with faces that uh, of of the days of yore in the past when women still partnered with men uh, in order to secure financial resources and all these hypotheses can be tested to varying degrees so look at China the uh, a, a country which has a burgeoning uh, bourgeoisie population a burgeoning uh, nouveau riche population, and you can see this, uh, of course, illustrated in the now somewhat infamous song, a favorite of young Lord Colonel Absconder, uh, No Car, No House, I'll be posting a link. I suppose it's humorous to a certain extent, but it, it attests to the fact that women, what women really want, they want a car and a house, metaphorically speaking and realistically speaking, they just want the goodies. They don't care about how they get the goodies or who gives them the goodies, they just want the goodies. And this can be tested in, in China because they've experienced uh, just a rapid economic growth in the last 20 years to the point where Chinese women have no reason to feign uh, any sort of interest in men beyond what men could potentially give them, especially if the state can give it to them. And of course, I've covered this in previous videos, the distinction in rural divorce uh, rates and, and just interest in, in marriage in general in rural areas versus interest in, in urban areas. I mean, it's all been documented. So you can see that, and that rapid economic growth has provided a catalyst for women to drop the facade, essentially. Uh, furthermore, um, this uh, subscriber of mine from the Land of Oz mentioned that a colleague of his had brought back a Thai woman to Australia, and within weeks she had transformed into a vindictive, money-grubbing, uh, essentially a nightmare on two legs, and he had to send her back. This is not an uncommon uh, phenomenon. And, for example, the famed traditionalist, Wisdom Through Logic, who uh, likes to laud the merits of foreign women, himself, uh, he himself has married a Filipina and dwells on that, in that land and is married and I believe has at least one or two children and refuses to bring his wife back to the United States because he's not done. He knows what would ensue and what would happen. Mind you, uh, the Philippines, uh, one of the few nations in the world where divorce is illegal, so double insurance. So what I'm trying to say here is that these hypotheses can all be tested. You can take trips for yourself. You can travel to see whether or not behavior of women elsewhere is based on anything but instinctive hypergamous nature and what would happen potentially if uh, you were to bring said woman uh, back to the states and as I've said many times culture is a mitigating factor it can put constraints on certain behavioral tendencies both in men and women in the case of women if the cultural constraints are there uh, you'll probably see a lot less overt hypergamy right? because women will have no will require will need to maintain the facade to the extent that they can in order to get access to get hold of financial resources from men also in cases where the, the state is not providing them with all the benefits such as in western uh, countries and then you get mixed cases um, like South Korea for example which has uh, centuries-long tradition of neo-Confucianism, very, very strict uh, behave code of behavioral conduct. It's encoded into the language, essentially, and the morphology of the language itself. Lots of bowing and deferential titles and endings you put onto to all sorts of words for the sake of uh, acknowledging different rank and st uh, ranks and station. Um, but the same sense, the same token, as I mentioned before, what happened in the late 1990s economic crisis, the divorce rate just shot up. As I like to say, when the going gets tough, women get up and leave. <laughs> so, 
all these things can be tested. And in, say, in the case of South Korea, the tension uh, between old cultural doctrine, essentially, and modern opportunities. Women, more and more women, are becoming financially independent in South Korea. They have more opportunities to work for themselves. A lot of them actually do work pretty hard. So they're needing, quote-unquote, needing men less and less. And we all know what happens when that, uh, when that occurs. We've seen it... Uh, in the West, for example, so you. But in the same sense, you have this cultural pressure to get married, so that's causing tension there. And the government, the Korean government, much like the Japanese government, actually is, has been for a while now offering economic incentives to couples there to reproduce, because the birth rate is uh, quite low. Um, economic prosperity, as Barros has mentioned, uh, in his previous video actually contributes to a lower birth rate than a higher one, which isn't uh, counter any logic whatsoever. It makes sense. Um, you know, part of it is uh, there's less need to reproduce ubiquitously and, and constantly to make up for uh, well, poor health, children dying, and what have you. And the other and uh, other part part of it is just women not wanting to be part, part of the whole baby factory uh, industry. That, I mean, it's deba certainly women harbor the wish to have children on some level, but I wonder often if, and I don't believe it's the case, I do not think women wish to reproduce as much as men do. I think the desire to reproduce in men is far stronger, far, far stronger than it is in women. And you see this by the dropping birth rates in Europe. You know, highly educated women, many of whom are you know, financially independent, and of course they don't look for relationships. The state gets gives them most of what they need, and they work for the rest. Uh, they they're not reproducing a whole lot. And Japan is you know the classic example. You know, men there, with all the men going their own way, these herbivore men, however you want to term them or describe them, they. Uh, they are an example that they women got a lot of benefits from the state uh, many of them becoming economically independent and they just have no need for men anymore see what I'm trying to stress here is that not only can these hypotheses be tested across different cultures just to see the the range I mean the range the hypothesis is a hypergamy theory this this is how women act and interact with men uh, but that women will just be just as likely to court the faceless man as they would be a man with a face. And as in this fantastical scenario I, I uh, mentioned, perhaps even a giant supercomputer that runs the world. Uh, whatever, whatever is the best source for resources, women will be drawn to it like, uh, like shit draws flies. Um, the sexual attraction then in women is then reduced to the, the thug attraction. This is I've mentioned this before in previous in a previous video that whether or not women uh, have women's instincts are optimal in terms of uh, mate selection because women are not naturally attracted to so-called I hate the term beta providers uh, men who labor in order to gain access to vagina golden uterus and reproductive resources. Their true instinctive attraction are to, as Barbara, Barbarossa put it very well once, these alpha male primitives, these thugs, uh, criminals, violent men, uh, men who, who, who are alpha in a sense, alpha in the sense that they're willing to commit violence, alpha in the sense that they're willing to uh, inflict violence on others, in particular alpha in the sense that they're willing to inflict violence on other men for the sake of the woman. Generally speaking, of course not all women, but we speak of general tendencies, that is the model of man that women feel physical and sexual attraction to. However, that man rarely provides for the woman, so she needs another source of that provision. And that can be the, a, a beta provider in the case of cuckolding, or it can be the faceless man in the case of many modern states of the world. Or it could even be a giant supercomputer one, one day in the future, who knows. The distinction is uh, quite interesting, because as a man, you don't have this this somewhat bizarre dichotomy. Uh, you, I mean, men, generally speaking, 
simply want companionship. This is often, you know, this is a, a, a faux argument you often hear, for example, um, that, yeah, well, men from people who don't like hypergamy theory and don't like to talk about the true nature of men and women, they say, well, men, men are just using women uh, to get get things for out of them too. Well, well, like what? Well, I suppose there's the reproduction, yeah. But generally speaking, men want sex, fair enough, and just companionship. I mean, if you look back to the days of the past, when you were still blue pillar, when you were uh, still plugged into the matrix, and you still pursued relationships and had relationships, what did you seek from your girlfriend? Sex and companionship. Did you want any special favors from her? Did you want her to you, her to give you things all the time? No, you just wanted to spend time with her and have a bit of sex every now and then. Uh, now, compare that with uh, the laundry list of things that women claim they want and in, in actuality the things that they actually want. They want uh, the financial resources, comfort, all these things, and Matt is supposed to give it to them. In addition, they rarely fi find uh, such men sexually attractive, so on the other hand, they have the uh, the the alpha thug that they find find physically and sexually des uh, desirable. So you can't really compare apples and oranges. And to say that men perceive women as utilities to the extent that women perceive men as utilities is simply false and inaccurate. Uh, to say that seeking sex and companionship is as much a utilitarian perspective, behavioral perspective as uh, seeking, in part, a resource provider, a, a financial provider, a comfort provider, and then on the side something else to give you physical satisfaction. I mean, it's it's they're just apples and oranges, and you can't really compare them. So yes, you can test the hypotheses. You can test the hypotheses by your own observations of your own previous relationships in your lives uh, when you used to be a blue pillar, and observations of perhaps friends who are still involved in relationships. You can test it by journeying to different countries. Uh, this is, you see, this is the great craze amongst the still unenlightened men of the world who think that they can flee the West and go to places like South America, Brazil, uh, Peru, Thailand. I think the Chinese dream is, is uh, the bubble is slowly popping there, let's hope at least, for some men. And this idea that they can find refuge and succor, uh, succor in such in such countries, well, I suppose they could to a limited extent. But why? It's because many, many of these countries are poverty poverty stricken. Uh, they don't have the mechani level of mechanization, financial development that modern many modern most modern countries in the West, Africa, China, South Korea, Japan, that all these Eastern Asian countries essentially have these days. So they go there. And they, they think they've said, they say, Eureka, I found it. But they, they haven't really found anything. Uh, once again, I'll cite wisdom through logic. I mean, the Philippines, are, they're, they're, it's a poor country, basically a poor country. He lives in a rural area. Uh, it's no wonder that he would never bring his wife back to the States. I mean, the risks are just too great. So, having said all of this, you, know, you can test these hypotheses by journeying to different countries, by, by studying it online, even if you want. I've, I've, you can look at the, my, um, my w the work I've done on YouTube so far, and you can compile that as Barbaros as well, Barbaros's work as well. You can see, you can actually test these hypotheses uh, and come to very rigorous conclusions based on that. And this is related to validation, of course. Because it's very telling that, say, a man such as Wisdom Through Logic is not willing to risk, even though he believes that his wife truly loves him in his case, or uh, any other man who decides to marry a poverty-stricken woman in some rural area, uh, believes that his wife loves him and what have you, and uh, you, know, you know the pipe dream. That these these men are not willing to risk taking them back to the states. Why not? Well, for obvious reasons. They don't, the, the illusion would burst. The bubble would pop. And here we come to validation. The need for validation, for female validation, and validation of the self through the female in men is so great that they are willing to consciously deceive themselves in some cases, knowing that it is a giant illusion, knowing that it's simply not true, in order to feel 
validated in order, in order to fuel value. And that's very telling. To consciously know that something's a lie, that it has no real substance, and still, and still pursue that lie because you feel validated by it. I mean, to make it a bit clearer, if, if, if let's say we have woman A, woman A from the Philippines or Colombia or some other poverty, uh, poverty stricken rural area of, uh, of the semi third world, she behaves a certain way in that area. Let's say you move her back to the United States or Canada or the UK for that matter. All of a sudden her behavior changes. Is that the same woman? Of course it was. It was the same woman the whole time. It's just in fantasy land in that rural poverty stricken area. She behaves one way because it's required in order to better her own life. And she behaves another way in another area, such as the West or West developed West, because it's that's the way she can better her life there. And she has no need for the facade anymore. Testing hypotheses. Most of the arguments I've made, as well as Barbara Russell's and other people who work on this stuff, they can all be tested. Uh, you can do the tests. I've, and I've made videos about this in the past, uh, the contrast between rural and urban divorce in China, uh, what happened in during the East Asian, uh, the Southeast Asian crisis to Korea with the divorce rates just shooting up. <laughs> uh, if you're interested, check out the divorce statistics in Indonesia. They are just shooting through the roof. And this is the country with the most Muslims in the entire world. Well, Indonesia is modernizing, becoming more modern, becoming more mechanized. More women are working. It's becoming more, well, quote unquote, liberal. That is, women are, are more, more and more in the workplace, in the workforce. And what happens? Well, divorce goes up because they don't really need the men. Women have never needed men. No, they have never needed men. They needed the figure of man, the, the man with a face in the past, because there was no alternative. Well, no alternative to insulate themselves from the dangers of the world, be it frost, fire, or the or fang. Uh, they didn't. They didn't need man per se. It's just that men sort of fit a role at the time. The faceless man does a much, much better job at it, quite frankly, and that's why no man can compete. That's why trad cons get upset when uh, when the faceless man gives women what they want. In the future, maybe this supercomputer would do the same. Who knows? So, yes, testing hypotheses. All these hypotheses can be tested. Just journey out into the world, or you don't even have to do that. Do the research on your own. If you seek the truth, you will find the truth. But this need for validation apparently is so strong that some men will knowingly deceive themselves in order to maintain a lie, something they know is a lie. And how do they know it? Because they, they, they know if they were to bring their spouses, their female spouses, back to their home countries, that the usual would ensue, that they would, over, over the course of a few weeks, just mutate and change into a quote-unquote different person. So of course, not a different person at all, but uh, just some food for thought here, gentlemen. This idea that these hypotheses can actually be tested. People who deny the validity of hypergamy theory and women's behavioral patterns based on that. And furthermore, to the point, I think I really need to stress this is this, this faux comparison of, well, men, men use women too. Uh, not really. Uh, seeking sex and companionship, uh, really simple things at the end of the day, is not the same as seeking physical, monetary, financial, social, every, the, whole, the, whole, the whole cornucopia, the whole basket of things. And on top of that, that's, not all, that's usually not the man who can, uh, who can provide her with sexual and physical satisfaction, so if she seeks that elsewhere else cuckolding wouldn't exist. Um, let's be honest. Uh, people say with cuckolding rates are what, from 10% 10, 10 to 25%, depending on who you ask or what study has been done. But if you look at the faceless man, I the state, uh, there's a lot more cuckolding going on there. Uh, so you have uh, 
the, the bad, the so-called bad boy that the woman is in a game of uh, courtship with, if you will, but she also has a game of courtship with the faceless man. That's how it works. Ultimately, all I want, and then what I do on this channel, now, people, I was asked the question, do I seek validation through this channel? Not really. I could shut this channel down tomorrow and just get on with other projects because for myself I've realized certain internal truths I apply them to my life and it works fairly well but I think there's a lot more work to be done and a lot more men to be helped out there and a lot more to be said on the subject ultimately because we've just cracked the surface uh, these are just theories hypotheses that can be tested but there's so much more work to be done because, well, quite frankly, no one's been talking on the topic. And the people who do talk about it, uh, I find, are touching on a far too super superficial level. So, for example, I like Warren Farrell a lot, but he's caught up in this whole get rid of Marxism and everything will be fine again, for the most part. Uh, he recognizes certain biological inclinations, but he doesn't offer any advice on how to deal uh, with them. He just says, well, get rid of Marxism and everything will be fine. Um, so... I want to more men to realize that it's not just feminism that's just part of the puzzle. It's something about our very nature, it's both our nature as men and women's nature as women, that have led us to where we are right now, to this giant mess. And if people don't realize that gynocentrism is the driving force behind civilization, uh, that you know, essentially civilization was erected uh, based on men's drive to impress women, I, you know, climb up in the dominance hierarchy, their need for validation, uh, then we, if we don't reverse engineer that, which is very unlikely, I think, um, given the current trends, things are not going to look very good in the future. So, no, I don't, I'm, I'm not doing this to validate myself, I'm just doing this to just get the information out there as, to as many men as possible. Uh, because, this pipe dream uh, if you want to live the illusion it's not going to help you uh, when you're in a really bad place in a really bad spot and there's no one out there for you, you know, if you if you think you can rely on an illusion to keep you going uh, that illusion will eventually dissolve and uh, the consequence could be pretty dire anyway bit of a rant but my point being yes you can test all these hypotheses and uh, do the test now. Like I said, look up Indonesian divorce. It's pretty interesting. Thanks for watching and take care.